is one of the most bizarre medical mysteries in recent memory, and doctors still can't explain it. Quick, when I ask you to name a toxic person, what's the first thing that you think about? Your ex-boyfriend, your ex-boss, your co-worker who keeps bragging about how they crushed their project when in fact you did 90% of the work and only got 10% of the credit? Or maybe you just answered Andrew Tate and called it a day. Women are also addicted to drama. This is something else you have to understand about females. Well, no matter what your answer, what if I told you there was a woman so toxic that she was A, literally dubbed the toxic lady by the press, even though B, she wasn't toxic in the way that you're probably thinking. Today, we're diving into the dark waters of a bizarre, twisted story from 1994 about somebody who became ill and exposure to her body, both physical and airborne, made dozens of hospital workers terribly sick after contact. But first, hi, hello, it's Swoop, and welcome to the dark waters of the sus pool, the place where everything and everyone is sus, maybe even us. I dare you. Come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> All right. Welcome back, Suspirians. This story is absolutely wild and has a twist that I did not see coming. So get ready. Now, if you're new here, welcome. This is my second channel. On my main channel, Swoop, I do full length deep dives investigating true crime and social media influencers. But over here, we dip into the dark waters of scary stories while trying to figure out who or what is going in the sus pool because everything is sus, all right? We got to figure it out. So if you're into short, dark, and twisted stories, subscribe to this channel and bring a towel and say hi to the like button, okay? She could use a little tickle today. Okay, we're going to dip into this story, but first, how's your relationship doing? Do you feel like your communication could use a little oomph? Well, I've got just the thing to help. So a big thank you to today's sponsor, The Paired App. You've heard me say it before, but I just love, love, love The Paired App. Let me fill you in on why it is amazing. Paired is a relationship care app that you can use to deepen your connection and relationship with your partner with super fun daily couples questions, relationship games, quizzes, and so much more. Like, you know those couples games where you answer a question and then see if your partner's answer matches or see if you can guess their answer? Think of the Paired app like that, but way more insightful. So the Paired app gives prompts that create meaningful conversation about things that you maybe haven't thought to talk about. And what makes it really fun is that you can't see each other's answers and until you both finish the quizzes or games. And then when you see that they've answered, it's like unlocking a new closeness and intimacy. And you learn so much, not just about each other, but also about yourself. The interactive games are so much fun. They really help improve communication. And there's other fun items like a timeline tracker to keep record of special dates and memories, which definitely comes in handy for the anniversary gifts, or, you know, just reliving a favorite moment together. And the Paired app works with every kind of relationship, whether you just met or you've been dating for years years, there is no time limit on healthy communication, honey. Why not give your relationship the gift of a subscription to Paired for yourself and your partner? You can connect with each other all year long and really share how important your relationship is to both of you. I absolutely love the Paired app and I've been using it for months now. So treat yourself to a healthier, happier, more engaging relationship. Click my link below to get a seven day free trial and 25% off Paired Premium so you can deepen your connection with your partner because you deserve Serve it, honey. It happened two weeks ago in a Southern California emergency room. A team of medical workers collapsed. This story starts in Riverside, California, a relatively medium-sized city about 53 miles or so away from LA, known for being the location where the California citrus industry began, the hometown of Michael Jackson, cover band Alien Ant Farm, and the birthplace of Rosie Hernandez, who was born on January 11th, 1963. Everybody who ever met Rosie said she was an ordinary but incredibly kind woman, with a reverend of Riverside referring to her as quote, a friend to everyone she met and a joker who brought joy to others. Now, Rosie spent almost her entire life in Riverside. It's where she got married. It's where she had her two children. It's where she got a divorce. It's where she met her boyfriend. Now, life wasn't easy for Rosie, but she was relatively happy. That is until the 30-year-old mother of two received the tragic news at the end 
end of 1993, only weeks before her 31st birthday, that she had cervical cancer. Now, only a month and a half later, she learned that her cancer was in an advanced stage already, as in it had already started spreading across her body. Now, this news is not and never has been good news, but Rosie had to weigh out the pros and cons as well as she could. So she was unemployed and without health insurance at this time. And as you can imagine, living in the United States without healthcare is a hardship that no one should ever have to face given how backwards the system can be for vulnerable communities. And according to Rosie's sister, she began chemotherapy around this time, something her sister claims only close family knew due to Rosie being a private person. And in fact, most people were oblivious to Rosie's struggles at all, no matter how hard it got until February 19th, 1994, when tragically everybody would know about Rosie Hernandez. February 19th, Rosie is at home with her boyfriend, dressed casually to relax for the night in, in a t-shirt and shorts. And Rosie hasn't been okay for quite a while, as you can imagine. I mean, she was living a nightmare, but today was a little worse than usual. She's been nauseous. She's been vomiting all day. And towards the end of the night, Rosie tells her boyfriend that she's worried because she's having trouble breathing and something feels off about her heartbeat. Now, seeing the writing on the walls, her boyfriend calls 911 around 8.15 p.m. Paramedics arrive shortly after, who rush her over to Riverside General Hospital, all while administering oxygen on the way. Now, Rosie gets gurneyed through two separate sets of glass doors to take her to a small curtained location dubbed Trauma Room 1. Now, although Rosie was awake, her responses were short and sometimes even incoherent, and even worse, her breathing was shallow rapid and inconsistent, and her heart was beating so fast its chambers couldn't even fill before pumping. Basically means that her blood pressure was dropping very fast. Mary Willis, a respiratory therapist who was assisting in the trauma room that evening, told Discover Magazine that for a woman with advanced cervical cancer, this was normal. However, it was not normal given the fact that she was only 31 because, quote, most patients who show up in an emergency room with such symptoms are elderly people. So medical staff tried to assist Rosie by injecting her with a cocktail of assorted drugs for her condition like Valium and Ativan so as to get her to go under, as well as lidocaine and bretillium to calm her abnormal heartbeat down. And as for Mary Willis, she used an Ambu bag, which is one of those kind of like rubber pump masks that you see at hospitals to pump air into Rosie's lungs. Now, unfortunately, none of what Mary and staff were doing was helping. So they tried defibrillating her heart, but this is where the first truly confusing thing in this story happened. The staff reported that it looked like there was some kind of oily sheen covering Rosie's entire body. Now, many also noticed that the closer they got, the more that there was a strange scent emanating from Rosie, like a mix of fruit and garlic and at the time, it was assumed this was her breath. So, you know, you could consider like at, at this point, everyone is confused and, and trying to figure out what is going on. What is this like sheen? What is this smell? And an RN named Sarah Carr enters the scene. Now, Sarah was tasked with collecting Rosie's blood to analyze. So she swabbed Rosie's right arm with alcohol, administered a catheter to Rosie, and then put a syringe in her. Now, everything seemed to be going fine, I mean, you know, as, as fine as one can be in this very awful situation. But then suddenly everything changed. And this is the moment where everything just, honestly, if I can be blunt, it just, it went to hell because as Sarah's syringe filled up, she noticed something unusual, the smell of chemicals, a scent that she couldn't trace the origin of. So she handed her syringe to Mary, told her about the scent and got closer to Rosie to try to figure out where it came from. Meanwhile, Mary, who now has the syringe, she sniffed the syringe and as she put it to Discover Magazine, quote, I thought it would smell like chemotherapy the way blood smells putrid when people are taking some of those drugs. Instead, it smelled like 
ammonia. Now from here, Sarah passed the blood off to a medical resident named Jeanette who noticed something else unusual. Yellowish, brownish particles just kind of floating around in the blood. And you know, these types of things aren't supposed to be in the blood. And this was confirmed by the doctor uh, who was heading the ER. But before anybody could do anything about this development, Sarah, the RN nurse who took the blood, started walking down the exit and began to sway around. It's the nurse to start an IV that about coincidentally at the same time I smelt, you know, ammonia. To me it was ammonia. And I kind of made a comment that, you know, that's really strong ammonia. And I kind of felt, you know, like I was going to pass out then. So I moved around to the other side of the bed to get away from the fume. Now the doctor ran towards Sarah and managed to catch her before she fell. She was very, uh, just losing her balance, swaying all over the place. And as the doctor managed to catch her, they noted that her face felt like it was on fire before sending her away from the room on a gurney. So now this nurse is, is losing her balance, is unstable, face feels on fire, and she's very ill very suddenly. Then, within seconds after that, Jeanette, who Sarah had passed the blood off to in the syringe, well, Jeanette said that she had started feeling extremely nauseous and lightheaded before she too left to gather herself at a nurse's desk. And, you know, she was asked, like, are you okay? Are you okay? By a staff member. And right as Jeanette began to answer, she collapsed to the floor just just like a sack of potatoes, for lack of a better description. She just collapsed right then and there. So she too was wheeled off, uh, described as shaking intermittently to where every few seconds she would stop breathing altogether for a few moments and then take a few breaths and then the process would repeat all over again. I mean, can you imagine this just, it's just happening to these nurses just out of nowhere very suddenly? I mean, how do you even, I just can't even imagine like the, the stress that must have been setting in with everyone. Now this condition that uh, Jeanette was going through is known as apnea. A lot of you might be familiar with like sleep apnea and people have machines, you know, that they wear when they sleep at night. But Jeanette had no prior history of having apnea. This is, this is all new territory happening within just minutes, right? So while this was happening, Mary, so you remember Mary, the nurse who was assisting in the trauma room? Well, Mary also collapsed. That's three now, coming in and out of consciousness and unable to control her limbs. Like, yeah, like it's just, man, the more like I, I think about this as we get into this story, you've got all of these nurses just suddenly collapsing. Like that would be freaking terrifying. Like I, I think like suddenly all these medical professionals are just like dropping to the floor and going unconscious and having trouble breathing just randomly. I just, I can't imagine how scary that would be. Now these are trained professionals, so they they are, you know, if something like that's going to happen, you want it to happen at a hospital and there are people there who know how to jump in and, and try to help. But like, my gosh, it's, it's just wild to try to put yourself in that environment, in that setting and see all of this happening. So at this point, total panic set in at Riverside General, which is the last thing that you want happening at a hospital, right? Like staff were ordered to get all ER patients to the parking lot outside while a small crew tried to get Rosie stable. And I just, again, like, can you imagine that it's just such a nightmare? Like they're putting all the, the, these patients who are very, very vulnerable, they're in the ER and they're just having to be taken out to the parking lot. It's terrifying. And like, if you're staff, you're seeing people getting seriously ill all of a sudden and you're asked to stay and help. Like, so, so finding the team to get Rosie stable was very difficult when many of the Riverside General staff members started saying that they were feeling sick now as well. And so you have the admin at the hospital in, in, in just a panic and eventually declared a state of emergency. So the small crew on site were having a lot of trouble with Rosie, whose blood pressure 
pressure was dropping rapidly while her pulse grew fainter and fainter. And electric shock after electric shock, drug after drug, the, the head doctor pulled out all of the stops. So, you know, bless his soul and the staff who stuck around, but it was unfortunately very sadly to no avail because at 8.50 p.m., Rosie Hernandez had tragically and very sadly passed away at the very young age of 31 and a small crew of two had to move her body into an isolated room near Trauma 1. Meanwhile, as the, you know, the medical team was fighting for Rosie, in the parking lot, the remaining staff were treating the removed patients as well as their sick peers with minimal tools and medicine and only the glow of the street lights outside of them. I mean, this is something, it just, it sounds like a, you know, an actual like horror movie happening in real life. Like it's just awful. And I just think about how brave the, the, the staff were just still being there to help all of these people. Now, at this point, it was believed that the hospital had been hit by some sort of toxic or nauseous chemical or gas. So all staff were basically stripped down to their undies with their clothes vacuum sealed in plastic bags. Jeanette continued to experience apnea as well as severe tremors. Sarah's face was still very much inflamed and now she was involuntarily flailing her arms and her body. Now, one of the nurses was a woman who had helped move Rosie's body into the side room who suddenly began vomiting uncontrollably herself and her face began to get inflamed too before she too had to be carried off in a stretcher. So, I, I mean, I just kind of lost count at this point, but all in all, that night, there were 37 ER staff and a whopping 23 of them experienced at least one of the symptoms on display that night with five of them having to be hospitalized. Susan was hospitalized for 10 days and each day she too experienced apnea, but Jeanette perhaps had it the worst. If you're, you know, comparing, uh, according to Discover Magazine, she had spent 14 days in intensive care with her diagnosis being hepatitis, pancreatitis, and a vascular necrosis in her kneecaps, uh, which, you know, if you didn't know, is when bone tissue becomes starved of blood and starts to die off. So really scary stuff here. Now, because the necrosis was in Jeanette's knees, she had to use crutches for months following her discharge. Old lady, my lungs still aren't up to par. You know, I just brush my hair and I'm very exhausted. As an emergency room physician, you've obviously hooked up people to all kinds of tubes, breathing tubes, IVs, etc. Now you've been on the other end of it. How did that feel? This experience has uh, completely changed my thinking process. Um, you know, when you do things emergently sometimes, you know, uh, it's difficult to make the patient comfortable, but uh, I think if I'm in that position, I'll go the two extra seconds or a minute to comfort the patient and, and make if it is their last few moments comfortable because I had a lot of procedures here and uh, it was, it was scary, mm -hmm. it was scary. All of this and nobody knew why the hell was this even happening at all. Okay, so what in the actual hell just happened? What was with the chemical smell? What was the, the oily body sheen that they had talked about? And how did this one woman tragically dying young lead to a lifetime of health problems for what, like 23 people? Well, the truth is, <laughs> We don't know. Seriously, there there are theories, uh, some of which were at one point treated as the answer. For now, the best I can do is share what I could find some of those theories and speculation were. So after that absolute just clusterfuss of a night, just a tragic all around. Uh, the press in 1994, newspapers and TV broadcasts alike were enamored with the idea of a woman so toxic, again, not personality wise, but physically, that she unleashed fumes and got everyone around her sick. Now we're not, of course, blaming her for any of this. What happened is very, very sad, but you know, one of the absolutely most all encompassing forensic investigations followed 
as you can imagine, with local, state, and federal units alike looking over every possible outcome of what this could be. Now, at one point, poisonous sewer gas was pitched. Some ran conspiratorially, claiming that Rosie was some kind of sleeper agent for terrorism, though that idea never truly took hold, I think, thank goodness. But in order to even give Rosie an autopsy, a special team decked head to toe in hazmat suits had to search Riverside General top to bottom for any signs that it was anything other than her that led to the staff collapsing. And the staff was protected with hazardous duty suits. Afterwards, everyone was hosed down with decontaminants. And after doing all of that, then they sealed her body in an aluminum casket and postponed her autopsy for a week to ensure that they could seal up a special room to investigate her. And once there, they gave her three autopsies. Now, in the course of one, it was found that Rosie had traces of Tylenol, lidocaine, and codeine in her system, uh, none of which was out of the ordinary for a sick individual. However, the first break through was the discovery of Tygen in her system, an anti-nausea medicine that breaks down into amines in the body. And amines are related to ammonia, AKA the smell Sarah had noticed. Remember when she noticed that ammonia smell? But that wasn't actually the big find. No, the big find was a substance known as dimethyl sulfone in her system. Now, dimethyl sulfone is a natural thing in humans as something that breaks down other substances, usually it disappears quickly. But even six weeks after Rosie's death, there was three times the normal amount of the substance in her system. So this led to the first major theory and one that uh, many people still believe today that Rosie Hernandez had caked her body top to bottom in something called dimethyl sulfoxide or DMSO for short. So, okay, let's do a quick Google search to see what DMSO is. And okay, here's WebMD saying, quote, DMSO, or dimethyl sulfoxide is a byproduct of paper making. It comes from a substance found in wood. DMSO has been used as an industrial solvent since the mid 1800s. Okay, this is very strange. So an industrial solvent, AKA a cleaner, or more specifically a degreaser. Why, why on earth would Rosie be covered head to toe in a degreaser? Well, as the theory goes, DMSO has been used for for decades as a kind of home remedy for various pains, which is helped along by the fact that it's very easy to get in gel form from hardware stores. So WebMD also points out it has been approved by the FDA for painful bladder syndrome symptoms, as well as treating shingles, but has a more controversial life as an alternative cancer treatment. Yeah, also DMSO is said to have a garlicky taste. Remember the garlicky smell? So basically, if you haven't caught on, the theory is that Rosie caked her body in DSMO to try to treat her cancer, not knowing that there could be negative impacts of this. Uh, what uh, I could just imagine, was there some desperation of her trying to do some home treatments or was this like a casual thing? Like maybe she heard about it or read about it. You know, it's not like this was some quack pseudo science necessarily. As far back as the 1960s, there was a, a trend in medicine proclaiming DMSO to be a cure all that Discover Magazine points out had doctors advise people to take DMSO to relieve pain and reduce anxiety and even had athletes use DMSO cream to relieve achy muscles. And even though a study showed that DMSO could actually ruin your eyesight, it transitioned into being a sort of underground treatment for everything. Kind of like, remember when like, I don't know, maybe it depends on where you grew up, but like your mom would just like rub some tussin on it, just put some tussin on it. Okay, if you're not feeling well, put some dust on it. I, I just kind of feel like, was this kind of one of those things? Now, if the theory that Rosie were doing this was correct, then scientists posited that when you expose DMSO to oxygen, it converts to dimethyl sulfate as opposed to dimethyl sulfone, which is not a cure-all. Rather, as a gas, it could actually attack the cells in your eyes, lungs, and mouth, cause convulsions, delirium, and 
paralysis. In fact, nearly all of the symptoms declared by Riverside General Staff were consistent with symptoms of dimethyl sulfate exposure. Now look, okay, like we all know I, I'm not a scientist, so diving too deep into this runs the risk of spreading misinformation. So I'll say the parts that I think I understand, and if all of this aligned, it, it's, it's just, it is, it is in, Tense. So what am I trying to say? If this theory is correct, and it's just a theory, uh, it's alleged that it's because Rosie was experiencing a urinary blockage due to her kidney failure, and that mixed with the oxygen, which was administered in route to the hospital in the ambulance, coupled with the DMSO, that all of that created a substance that crystallized in Rosie's blood, which would then turn those crystals into dimethyl sulfate, which then became a gas, which then hit the medical staff, holy shit, that is so much, like my gosh, okay? Just like think about that. If that were true, literally no one, like no one, no one, no one would likely have even thought about this, let alone known to look out for this combination of things to try and stop any further exposure or toxicity, right? Like who who would even know? This theory is in fact quite controversial for many. Uh, for instance, one of the biggest issues that critics of the theory bring up is that this exact chain of events seems unlikely, is unlikely, and has been impossible to reproduce. Yeah, I know, what the actual f going on? Furthermore, this theory can't be tested on Rosie's body and even couldn't be at the time since all traces of the dimethyl sulfone uh, would have been evaporated or broken down by that point. And, and I think science, like things have to be replicated. You have to be able to replicate them for them to become fact, if I understand that right. Now, another factor that complicates this is that every member of Rosie's family, including her own boyfriend, denies that she was even using DMSO as a treatment. So. What does that mean? You know, one would think that, the, you know, her boyfriend and family would know these things, but of course, you know, people can do things in private. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to speculate on that. On April 12th, 1994, half of the mystery was announced as solved uh, when county officials stated Rosie had passed of heart failure due to kidney failure from her late stage cervical cancer. Now, her body wasn't released for around two months for a funeral due to national national fears, literally national fears that people could pass out or get injected as a result of her body. And to say that the Hernandez family was upset would be an understatement and understandably so, but also maybe perhaps in a way that you might not expect. According to the Washington Post, Rosie's family believed that Rosie's death was the fault of the hospital and the hospital alone, stating that they had hired an independent pathologist whose conclusion was that Rosie did not not die of cancer and that Riverside General had bungled the investigation in the name of covering up their own wrongdoings. So yeah, like the, 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 just the story keeps turning, right? Now, Rosie's sister told the Washington Post, quote, it takes them 10 weeks to say she died of natural causes. I don't believe anything the county officials or the coroner says. With Rosie's sister believing Rosie would still be alive had she gone to literally any other hospital. Now, to be fair, the Washington Post does point out that the hospital had been cited for cleanliness violations in the past, but also that the county never found anything even hinting at the hospital being liable. So the final verdict, at least officially, might be Occam's razor. Rosie Hernandez, a woman who was fading of cancer, sadly passed of cancer and a random chain of events may have led to her body becoming so toxic, it made the staff at Riverside General sick, or did it? Y'all, 
The story doesn't stop there. No, there's there's another twist to this whole story. Hang on to your asses, my friends, because somehow misogyny manages to enter the damn chat, allegedly. Shocking. So before the theory ever came to light that Rosie may have unintentionally and unknowingly created a toxic situation through allegedly covering her body in DMSO, there was a theory put forth by California's Department of Health and Human Services that initially gained traction Action. DHHS had two scientists interview 34 Riverside staff with a standardized questionnaire to get to the bottom of this story, or at least attempt to. Now, according to the study, many of the subjects had severe symptoms like a loss of consciousness, shortness of breath, and muscle spasms. But each of these people had a few things in common. First, they had worked within a two-foot range of Rosie and handled her syringe or intravenous lines. That much was quite obvious. But what these scientists also found is that almost every person affected was a woman with a normal blood test after the fact, which holy sh is really freaking interesting. So what the hell? Like seriously, what, <laughs> what is the conclusion here? <sighs> well, Per Discover Magazine, quote, the hospital staff most likely experience an outbreak of mass sociogenic illness, perhaps triggered by an odor. In other words, they'd been felled by stress and anxiety. <sighs> yeah. Listen, I will say that again in plain terms because holy so this might, this might be a hot take, I don't know, but something about that makes me have all of the opinions and I am going to share my opinions, okay? So speculation alert. So according to Discover Magazine, via these scientists, because these were women and because they saw each other panicking, these <laughs> people suggested that the sickness was actually a mass hysteria event because fiddly we all know that women can't keep their sh together in high pressure situations, let alone professionally medically trained women who deal with life and death situations every single day they show up to work. But you know, what do I know? I mean, a sociogenic illness after all is one quote, caused or influenced by social factors rather than by a physical disease agent. And in this case, it was the scene mixed with everybody else feeling or claiming to feel ill. I just listen, I, I don't, ah, I just, these are like professional trained people to handle really urgent situations. They literally are working in the emergency room. So I don't, I don't personally buy that explanation. And I think that that type of thing is used like against women all the time to like imply that they're not professional enough. And like the fact that people have had symptoms for like a long time after the fact, I just, I don't, I don't buy that theory. Like I just, uh, it's just really frustrating. But you know, let me, let me, let me dial it down a little bit. Okay, pardon me. Sometimes I read react to things and that was one of those times. Now, this is perhaps the most controversial explanation for these events and you know, the one that I don't think I agree with at all. But again, what do I know, right? Uh, the two scientists were insistent, however, uh, due to the lack of obvious answers, uh, like no poisons found and what they claim was the likelihood that women were more likely than men to suffer the most serious symptoms. So, you know, it's now it's just, it's women's fault, I guess. I just, I don't know. Tell me your thoughts about that theory in the comments. Like, I feel like this sounds like bullshit. Uh, to, you know, in my opinion, but you know, this too made the news and sadly made the sick staff have to go on the defensive with Jeanette having to point out all the terrible sh that happened to her just to dispel the hysteria allegations and eventually sue Riverside General seeking out $6 million in damages. Wow, just wow. Which leads me to the final take that I have on this. I don't know. 
I really don't know. Like it's probably maybe the DMSO since every reputable take on this story concedes that even though the DMSO theory is flawed, it's still the most likely answer. But then how do you lean into that answer without going against the words of the boyfriend? I just, there's a high likelihood that no one will ever know exactly what happened that very fateful day in 1994. But I could say one thing for sure, finding the answer while maybe helpful for science, which of course is a very, very good thing, it still won't bring Rosie back, which makes this another very sad story with few answers. And I hope one day that her family can get answers if they are still searching. And I think at this point, the only thing that we can say that clearly belongs in the sus pool is cancer, because honestly, f cancer. <sighs> okay, Suspirians, that was, that is a heavy, heavy story. Uh, time is time to step out of the dark waters of the sus pool, grab a towel and dry off. That's what I got. Uh, so excuse the tone shift here, but if, if you want to hear more stories like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel and uh, tickle the like button for more. And uh, let me know in the comments if you have any stories that you would like to dip into. Uh, you can also follow me on Instagram and TikTok linked below. That's where I post most often and also announce opportunities to have your thoughts featured in my deep dives on my main channel, Swoop. I also have a brand new full deep dive Swoop doc out on my main channel, Swoop. It's linked below and in the pinned comment. Also, for any of you overachievers out there, uh, you could be sure to grab your very own pieces from the Valid Ribcage and Valid Social Club collection in the Petty University shop, linked below as always. I know that you're gonna love these pieces and stay tuned for the first official Suspool apparel coming soon. We have been working on that for months and months and months and months and months. Um, I'm so excited for you to see those pieces. Uh, they're a little bit late, <laughs> as it seems. Every time I try to hit springtime and then it just, it just, yeah. So we'll, we'll catch up. Also, huge thank you to our sponsor for supporting this channel. And of course, to all of you for giving your time and being here to watch. Be sure to click my link below to get a seven day free trial and 25% off paired premium so you can maintain and deepen your connection with your partner and treat yourself to the healthy relationship you deserve, honey. Thanks for coming a swim. Have a good day out there. Stay weird and I'll see you next time in the sus pool. Swoop. <laughs>